It's Sol 147 on your first trip to Mars. It was supposed to be the mission of a lifetime. You're going to get to do some amazing science and hang out with some awesome teammates. But things haven't gone so well. First of all, there was a bit of a storm where you got knocked out by an antenna. Then your teammates left you all alone on the planet to fend for yourself. <laughs> then, to add insult to literal injury, after 147 days on the red planet, on your own, you run out of ketchup. <laughs> the closest supermarket is over 50 million kilometers away. Even if Uber Eats decided to start a Martian delivery service, it'd take over 300 days for them to reach you, at which point the food will have begun to lose its taste and nutritional value. And the delivery costs would be outrageous. Every kilo of mass transported from Earth will likely cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Add in a tip for your driver, and it's starting to look like maybe you'll need to find another way to get your catch up. It won't be long before we become a multiplanetary species. It's in our human nature to explore. Just as our ancestors developed the tools and the social skills to venture beyond the savanna to populate the entire globe, we're now developing technology that will transport us beyond Earth. But the technology that we create to get us to Mars won't be of any use to us if we can't find a way to feed ourselves once we get there. It'll be nearly impossible to transport all the food we need from Earth to our new home. We're going to have to figure out a way to produce our food once we get there using the resources found on Mars. We call this in situ resource utilization, or ISRU. The basic ingredients we'll need include CO2 and other gases from the atmosphere, water from frozen deposits found on the planet, and minerals and salts from the Martian soils and rocks. Unfortunately, Martian soils aren't really conducive to agriculture. They're full of heavy metals, and they're saturated with perchlorates, which are water-soluble, chlorine-based molecules that are toxic to humans and many of the things that we'd like to grow. We're going to either need to figure out a way to remove these toxic compounds or to engineer organisms that can thrive in non-ideal, resource-limited environments. When we think of food organisms, we often think of grains like wheat, fruit like apples, or animals like cows. But even the most efficient cattle will be far too resource-intensive for our Martian outpost. We're going to have to think much smaller and much simpler. We're going to need to get flour without grain fields, apples without trees, and steaks without cows. And if we want ketchup, we're going to have to figure out a way to get it without tomatoes and onions. Fortunately, we've already begun to develop technology that can create organisms that can do this for us. The food we eat today is both the result of millions of years of natural evolution and thousands of years of human manipulation. Nature has selected for organisms that survive the best, and we've further selected the ones that taste the best. The end result is food that produces a lot of different chemicals. The same chemicals that can help protect organisms from predators can be beneficial to us in the form of flavors and nutrients. Thanks to decades of dedicated biochemical and genomic research, we now understand the genetic instructions that synthesize these delicious chemicals. These genetic instructions are found in the center of a cell, inside the nucleus. The nucleus holds a library of thousands of chemical recipes in the form of DNA. The DNA is organized into genes, and each gene provides a step in a chemical recipe. When we put several of these genes together, we get what we call a biosynthetic pathway. In these pathways, several genes work together to build up complex chemicals step by step from simple starting materials. What's really cool is that for many of these chemical recipes, we now understand exactly how each of these genes works to perform those steps. And advances in genomics have allowed us to get the precise sequences of those genes. And thanks to recent genetic engineering technologies, we also have the ability to precisely manipulate the genes in these pathways. We can turn genes on or off, we can take genes out, or we can put them into new organisms. We can even design entirely new biosynthetic pathways. This gives us the ability to develop enhanced organisms for the benefit of humanity and our planet. We're living in a really, really exciting time for biology, and I'm really lucky to be playing a role in it. I'm currently working at the University of Canterbury, 
in a fantastic collaboration with Callahan Innovation, Massey University, and Victoria University of Wellington, we developed a powerful new synthetic biology tool for assembling large biosynthetic pathways. Our system is called MIDAS, which stands for Modular Indempotent DNA Assembly System. In short, MIDAS allows us to combine dozens of genetic parts into a single piece of DNA. Although there are other DNA assembly systems out there, MIDAS is unique in several ways. First, MIDAS allows us to assemble DNA seamlessly without leaving in extra bits of DNA that can interfere with downstream applications. And MIDAS gives users complete control over the gene order, orientation, and direction of DNA assembly. And this allows for fully customized biosynthetic pathways. <coughs> and MIDAS is simple. With just a few design rules and our suite of DNA vectors, anyone can quickly and efficiently assemble biosynthetic pathways. Our system starts with a library of small, reusable bits of DNA. These bits of DNA include the genes themselves, as well as bits of DNA that can turn genes on and then regulate how they do their jobs. We can choose from as many or as few bits of DNA as we need in order to get a complete set of genetic instructions in a pathway. Then we throw these little bits of DNA into one big pot, or in this case, a tiny tube, with some enzymes that recognize specific sequences in our DNA. From there, those enzymes act like very precise scissors and glue for cutting and pasting our DNA. In just a few steps, MIDAS can turn lots of little bits of DNA into a functioning biosynthetic pathway. This gives us the ability to mix and match individual genes to create new biosynthetic pathways. These new biosynthetic pathways that can then be engineered into a variety of organisms, from bacteria and yeast to fungi and plants. So far, we've used MIDAS to assemble tens of thousands of letters of genetic code into discrete pathways. The pathways that we assemble can be used to synthesize molecules that can be used as antibiotics, insecticides, anti-cancer drugs, and other pharmaceuticals and agriculturally valuable compounds. We're currently putting these pathways into simple lab-based organisms like filamentous fungi, which are similar to the mold that grows on your bread. Using these fungi, we're now developing methods to produce large-scale volumes of high-value compounds that we couldn't produce with traditional methods of chemical synthesis. With MIDAS, we can turn mold into gold. <laughs> but MIDAS is not limited to lab-based organisms used to produce industrial chemicals. MIDAS can also be used to design and engineer new food organisms for Mars. To start our Martian colonies, we're probably going to have to engineer our organisms on Earth first, and then fly initial stocks of them there. We've got some great starting materials in naturally occurring algae, yeast, bacteria, and fungi. In fact, we're already using many of these microbes in our current foods and pharmaceuticals. For example, we use yeast both to ferment the sugars and malt into alcohol, and to provide the base of our favorite Marmite spread. We use bacteria to make yogurt, and to produce life-saving insulin. We eat fungi in the form of mushrooms and use them to synthesize cholesterol-lowering statins. And the diversity of organisms found throughout the globe contain libraries of genetic information. The biosynthetic pathways contained in those libraries can be used to synthesize new flavors, nutrients, and textures into new food organisms. One of the first organisms we'll use will be cyanobacteria. We already eat cyanobacteria, in the form of spirulina, which is made from the dried cultures of cyanobacteria. In addition to being nutritionally balanced, cyanobacteria can also thrive using the most minimal of resources. Cyanobacteria can turn carbon dioxide, a few mineral salts, water, and sunlight into a soup full of sugars, proteins, fats, and essential vitamins. We can then take this, this soup, dry it down and harvest it, and use it as food itself. Or we can also use it to feed other simple and small organisms that can't photosynthesize, like yeast, bacteria, and fungi. So why go through all the trouble of engineering these organisms when we could just use them as they are? First, the food that we produce on Mars will need to satisfy all of our nutritional requirements to keep us physically healthy. On Earth, we can choose from a wide variety of foods to get that balance right. But we won't have that variety on Mars. We only have access to a few simple organisms. Getting them to provide everything we need is going to take some engineering. But food is more than simply filling our bellies. 
We also need to think about our human psychological needs. Tasteless algae paste may satisfy our calorie and nutrient requirements, but imagine eating only that for the rest of your life. It's enough to make even the most hardcore adventurer question the decision to move millions of miles from the nearest takeaway shop. As astronauts on the International Space Station can tell you, quality and diversity of food are really important for mental health. Eating the same mushy, rehydrated meals again and again for months on end can be soul-destroying. Pizza night on Earth is pretty great, but pizza night on the ISS is even better. Making delicious food with our friends makes us feel good and brings us closer to them. And the same will be true on Mars, where missions will extend long past the current ISS mission timelines of a year. So how exactly do we go about designing food that can satisfy all of our needs from simple organisms? Let's go back to our example of ketchup. Ketchup is not going to form the basis of the majority of our calories on Mars, but its ability to boost the flavor of our food and the morale of our Martian comrades is invaluable. Let's think about the traditional ingredients that go into making ketchup. We've got tomatoes, onions, garlic, sugar, salt, vinegar, and spices. Growing tomatoes and onions via hydroponics and aeroponics on Mars will be quite resource intensive. And much of that energy will go into making the inedible stems and leaves of the plants. And what about spices? How do we grow peppercorns and cloves on Mars? But we don't need whole tomatoes, onions, peppercorns, or cloves. Really, we just want the biomass and the flavors that they provide. This is where synthetic biology comes in. What if, instead of all the inefficient growing and processing of whole plants using the limited resources on the red planet, we could produce all of those ingredients using one resource-efficient organism? Using Midas, we could assemble the various biosynthetic pathways to produce different flavors. For example, we could engineer and then assemble the biosynthetic pathways for the production of lycopene and associated carotenoids that give tomatoes their flavor. Transforming those pathways into cyanobacteria would make a normally seaweed-flavored sludge taste like tomatoes. We could then take those tomato-tasting algae and introduce additional biosynthetic pathways to produce allicin, which is the chemical that gives garlic its flavor. We could also introduce the biosynthetic pathways for the production of capsaicin and piperine to add a bit of spice. Then we could give the algae the genetic instructions for increasing the cellular sugar content, and at the end of the algae's life cycle, we could turn on a pathway for producing a little bit of acetic acid. With this designer algae, we'd simply throw a starter culture into some salt water and give it some sunlight to grow. A week or so later, we'd strain out the water, and boom, we've got ketchup. <laughs> While this might seem like science fiction, I'm currently working on projects that will make this space ketchup a reality. In the same manner, we'll be able to engineer a variety of organisms that will provide a diversity of flavors, nutrients, and textures. We'll be able to make a cornucopia of ingredients that can be used as is with minimal processing. These ingredients can also provide the raw materials for creative Martian chefs to experiment with novel cuisine, perhaps engineering heme into mushrooms to make substitute steaks that bleed. These can be served with a potato-like mash made from yeast and a side of fresh lettuce salad, fortified to accumulate extra vitamins and minerals via bioengineering. The beauty of designing organisms for Mars is that their growth and consumption will not be limited to extraterrestrial colonization. On Earth, we have a population that continues to grow. We also have a shrinking acreage of arable land. Combine that with the challenges of a changing climate, and it becomes pretty clear that we need to utilize our limited resources on Earth as efficiently as possible. The only way that we'll be able to feed over 10 billion people without cutting down more forests is if we integrate the philosophy of a circular economy. On the space station, we currently have the technology to efficiently turn yesterday's coffee into tomorrow's coffee. <laughs> Don't think too much how that works. <laughs> Eventually, we're going to have to figure out how to turn yesterday's curry into tomorrow's curry. 
both on Earth and on Mars, will best be able to survive by using and reusing our limited resources to create and recycle food with near 100% efficiency. We're already moving in this direction, with some communities shifting towards more locally sourced plant-based diets. Cellular agriculture techniques that produce lab-based meat and milk will also play a role as these technologies become more resource efficient. The organisms that we design and engineer for Martian food will not only help us to establish extraterrestrial colonies, but can also be used to develop sustainable, delicious food supplies on Earth. We've gotten really lucky to have landed on a planet that has incredible resources, climate, and a protective atmosphere. Over millennia, our bodies have adapted to utilizing the resources here on Earth. But when broken down to their most basic building blocks, the resources on both Mars and on Earth are simply stardust. In the millennia to come, we will adapt to living on Mars. Our adaption will require creative solutions for feeding a growing Martian society. But if we can do it there, we can do it on Earth as well. And with dedicated scientific teams working hard on these goals, we'll have plenty of catch-up to go around on both planets. Thank you. <laughs>